to the Brownback Seminar Series number 13 of the Faculty of Social Science, uh, the Universitas Islam International Indonesia. Well, today uh, we are very lucky that we have our respected guest, Dr. Nayan Chandra, you know. Uh, Professor Nayan Chandra is very prolific scholar. Uh, he flew far away from Delhi to Jakarta, which is technically about, I think about 5,000 kilometers, you know, away from here, you know. And uh, we are very lucky that we have him today here and he would like to uh, give lecture to us on globalization and pandemics with the price of uh, shrinking world. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nayan Chandra for having uh, with us here. So uh, I would like also to thank to our Dean, uh, Dr. Philip Fermonte, so uh, to bring him uh, into this campus and we are very very honored uh, to have him here well dr dr nayan uh, chanda is uh, well he is coming from faculty of international studies or at the uh, ashoka uh, university he is teaching there uh, but actually his very rich experience uh, started from his very long career, you know. He has been visited Indonesia for many, many times in the past. Uh, and uh, he just said that the latest time he visited here, here Indonesia, as uh, about 23 years ago, you know. Uh, and, and he connected and he did interview to many of Indonesia's leaders at that time when uh, he was uh, uh, become, he was a journalist for the, he started, you know, his career, academic career from a journalist. He was uh, working for uh, Far Eastern Economic Review. You know, I think one of the, you recall, uh, Far Eastern Economic Review is among one of the, the best uh, newspaper uh, dealing on the political economic issues, you know, and uh, well, that's how he started. But then he moved to United States. Uh, he worked for several and many other institutions to include Yale University. You know, if we are talking today about globalization, and I think uh, he, he is, you know, the right person to talk about that. He wrote uh, many books and also articles uh, related to uh, globalization and also uh, to some other titles. If I might to uh, to call you to remembering on what he already wrote, uh, he wrote the books. Uh, the title is "A World Connected: Globalization in the 21st Century." That was published by Yale University. There is also a book on called "Globalization: uh, The Making of World Society." and also uh, several others to include Bound Together, How Traders, Preachers, and Adventures, and Warrior Shape Globalization, you know, and also a book about India and China in Emerging World Order. And uh, there is also another interesting book title called Brother's Enemy, uh, The War After uh, the War, you know. So, that are not working. And so the question is, what is globalization? That seems to lapse to head globalization. And so that was one of the many reasons I started exploring the word globalization. And the globalization, as you may know, that it was. It, was, it came to the dictionary for the first time in 
and 61, and that was the year um, shortly after Sputnik was launched, and long, long before American satellites went up connecting the world. But the word globalization is um, the five syllables, and it meant from Hemosakim, our ancestors, originated in East Africa. And they spread to the world over the next 50,000 years and occupied different spaces of the earth where they could um, make a living. And these communities spread to the world were reconnected. That is what globalization is doing. They were originally connected, they were in one place. And then, and so why did the people leave Africa? Because of Ice Age, there was a period so 40 to 15,000 years ago, when the earth was extremely cold and Sorry. Uh, the Ice Age was all of Northern Europe was under 150 feet high of snow. And the rest of the world was extremely cold. And during the day, there was no humidity. So it was, uh, sun was very strong. And so our ancestors who lived in this part of Africa, they were mm -hmm. running out of food, water was drying up, forests were catching fire, animals were fleeing. So they started walking out of Africa, looking for food, following the animals and looking for food. And that is how they left the um, East African original homeland. So I was very curious that if all of us came out of Africa, then there must be an evidence of that. And so the evidence was, is in all our DNA. So I sent a, I sent my DNA sample to an organization which was run by IBM and and National Geographic, Geographic Project. And so they did not know who I was. So I simply took a soap from my mouth, put in a vial and smelled it. And they analyzed the DNA and put it up, the results of it on the web. So I had a serial number on the vial, went and checked it. And it says you are Indian because your DNA marker is M52. And the M52 marker is all South Asians. And then looking deeper into a DNA, they said that my ancestors, came from here because my earliest DNA has M168. M168 is the Adam, African Adam DNA. Mm. All the males in this room, we all had M168. 
You just, I can challenge you, go and check. You have once again sold 6K. And then I have M89, which is a marker of Jordan Valley, which shows that my ancestors spent some time there. It's a process they acquired the local DNA, M89. And then they moved east, went past Iran. I have M201, which is the Iranian market. And then I acquired M52, arriving in India. So my DNA has like a visa stamp of my ancestor's journey through the entire Africa and Middle East. And so this is a proof enough that we are all coming from one little village called Africa. And we spread out to the world and connected. And now we are reconnecting this, um, this world that is. Um, yeah. So the globalization is a story of reconnection of this community. So in this talk today, I want to address three things. One is what is globalization? How did it come about? Why did we connect? What led us to reconnect? Second is what is the connection between globalization and pandemics? And thirdly, what can we expect in the future of globalization and pandemics? So the last this is the first uh, aspect of. So my study tells me that the desire to connect with other humans arise from many different motivations. But I kind of simplify it making a four different groups of people who want to connect with other humans. Traders, for obvious reason, if you want to make a living by buying and selling, you have to communicate with other humans. Preachers, who have found their God and their prophet, and they want to tell others, look, I have my prophet, follow him. So you want to connect. Third is adventurers. Those who are curious about the world, want to know what is behind the next mountain, what is on the other side of the river. They travel and connect. And fourth is warriors. People with ambition to control territory, control people, resources, and they have a sense of themselves as a, to be a leader, to be accepted as leader. And those people also connected the world, created vast empire, bringing many people together by force and creating the world that we know. So these are the four actors, traders, preachers, adventurers, and warriors. And we will just take a quick look as to how these people did. This is an image from Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago. You can see people going to the market, taking their, their um, animals, <clears throat> merchandise. And when they were doing this trading, they also developed first written script, the Sumerian script. And the Sumerian script was essentially developed for marketing to say, I am sending to you eight heads of sheep, and you will give me one tail of silver as the contract. And, to, and it is written on a piece of clay with, with a blade of grass, and that piece of clay is hard, so it is solid. And that's the kind of writing first developed in Mesopotamia. So Yale University Library has some 40,000 such uh, clay tablets. 
people are still translating them. So one tablet I found translated. It was a letter from a traders. See, trader's wife to her husband, who is away from home for months doing trading. And she wrote that in that piece of clay tablet. She says, since you left, Salima Hum, another trader, has already built a house double the size. When will you be able to do the same? <laughs> Just imagine, 4,000 years ago, the wife is writing the husband. Okay. <laughs> now, we were making a lot of business, but how would... Demanding what? Yeah. And so this message could have been sent on a WhatsApp or on a uh, cell phone message. The same idea, the same. We want to do trading because we want to live here. We want to have a more prosperous life. And that has led to people travel long distances carrying goods, bringing money at home. And this was Lamasi's letter to her husband Kusuken, 2000. <laughs> And so the trading, of course, involved goods, but traders also carried information. Arab traders who came to India, they took back many manuscripts. One of the manuscripts they took back was by someone called Aryabhatta, an astronomer. And his text was taken to Baghdad and there it was translated by a famous mathematician, Abu Jafar Muhammad Ibn Dusa al Khwarizmi. Al Khwarizmi translated and wrote his treatise in which he gave the concept of zero. Because until then, there was no zero. So Roman numerals, you, have, you cannot do calculations. You have to take x5, 3, 3, 3, x, x, x. You cannot do calculation. So the zero, concept of zero, was taken from India by Arab traders. And al Khwarizmi translated that and wrote his book. And as it turns out, his book written in Arabic was found by a British scholar in a library in, in Toledo, in Spain. Spain was under Islamic rule at the time. And so he translated that into Latin, al his book. And he was called Algorithm. al his name was transcribed in Latin as algorithm. So first sentence was Dixit algorithm. And you know where algorithm comes from. So the algorithm so algorithm comes from al Khwarizmi's text. And this is the result unintended consequence of trading connection. So this is how so much of what we have today, we know today, but coming from different parts of the world connected by one of the factors were the traders. And then we have the features. Features, one of the world's earliest uh, preaching religion was Buddhism because Judaism doesn't believe in preaching. But when Buddha had his enlightenment, he assembled his um, disciples, five of them, and said, go out to the world, preach to everybody who would listen, 
this is the way to achieve eternal peace and live a healthy, fulfilling life. And so Buddhist preaching, uh, ultimately Buddha was born 600 BC. By first century AD, it already reached China and then it was reached Korea and Japan. And from China, a, a, a very curious monk who followed Buddhism, but he wanted to understand much better by reading the original Bali text. And so he traveled to India. He crossed on foot Central Asian deserts and he arrived in India in the seventh century. And after 15 years in India, he traveled throughout. He spoke fluent Sanskrit. He debated the monks, defeated them in his Sanskrit uh, arguments. And when he returned, King Harshavardhana gave him horse, elephants, and many, many objects to take back home. And so when he returned to Xi'an in China, people sort of gathered on the both sides of the road to welcome the monk who has come back from the West. They didn't have no India, they, he has come back from the West. And he has brought all these sacred texts of Buddha, astronomy, mathematics, chemistry, all different texts he carried with him. And these are all in Xi'an uh, stored in the, uh, in the museum there. So among other things, Xuan Shang took from India is that he learned about sugar. The monks have one meal and throughout the day they suck on sugar for sustenance. And Chinese, he has never seen sugar. So how do you make this sweet rock, it was called, sweet rock. So he reported back to the Chinese emperor and Chinese emperor sent a delegation to India requesting that you send some technician who can help us make sweet rock. So sugar cane was introduced to China as a result of the visit of Xiong Shang. So you can see that it has nothing to do with religion. But so many things that we use, they have crossed the world because of the activities of traders and preachers. Sorry. So this is a 16th century painting of Arab traders coming to Java. And, and the Arab traders, whenever they went, they always carried with them a Quran. And they, people just respected them because they were very religious and they had a holy book. People have not seen a book which actually is God's word. So the Arab traders had an advantage over others because they are very respected because they were God-fearing, they prayed five times a day and they had a holy book. And so the result is that we have this university because of people like that. Okay. <laughs> so the adventures, this is the old painting of Marco Polo with his father and uncle going to China. And Marco Polo's visit was something, a remarkable event because until then, nobody has been to China has written about it. So Marco Polo returned and wrote his account of what an amazing place China was, what he saw. And on the way back, he also stopped in Southeast Asia. So his account brought the world closer. People knew that the world that we know, there is another world beyond our understanding or knowledge. And it was not surprising that Christopher Columbus, the sailor who went and to discover the new world, 
he read Marco Polo's account and he was very excited to go and find Japan. Japan was called Chipangu and Chipangu apparently had so much silver that they had roofs made with silver. That is what Marco Polo wrote. Of course, there's a lot of mythology there, but the fact is that Japan did produce a lot of silver in those days at a very rich silver mine. So Columbus set out to go to Japan across Atlantic. He thought he'll just go straight. He had no idea there is a big continent in between Europe and Asia. But this was the result of Marco Polo's visit. Another Ibn Battuta, the Jewish from Morocco, he had this wanderlust. He wanted to see the world. He, so he traveled some 7,000 miles on horseback, on boats, on foot. And he came to India. He came uh, to China. And his accounts, again, has informed us as to what the world was the time he was traveling. And finally, the warriors. This is Alexander of Macedon, Alexander the Great. And that was his so army reached up to the western part of India. And so what did Alexander do? Of course, he set, set up set behind some administrators and some soldiers stayed to rule those places he visited. And so there was a sort of Indo-Greek kingdoms developed in today's Afghanistan and Central Asia. And those Indo-Greek kingdoms actually facilitated trade because they were printing coins. And a lot of Alexandrian coins you can still find. And those coins facilitated trading. If you do not have a medium, how do you trade? Barter trade doesn't go very far. But most interestingly, these Greeks who were settled in this part of the world, they became a great devotee of Buddhism. So they want they worship Buddha. And Buddha, before he died, Buddha said, do not make a statue of me. If you want to remember me, make a footprint that I walked on this planet. I, I live there. That's it. Do not make a statue. But Buddhists, the, the Greeks didn't want to hear. So we want to worship. So how do you worship? They have to create an image. They had no idea how Buddha looked. They said, okay, we have. So Greek Hellenic heroes, Apollo, Apollo's face was transported with a little sort of curly hair to make Buddha. So this is not an Indian face. This is a Greek face. <laughs> But this was the Buddha for them, and they worshipped because this was Buddha as the image, and their imagination went as far as Apollo's Im image they have seen. So, so this is a, also an example of how um, warriors created connected world in so many different ways. And the last one I want to show is this. This is called House of Wisdom in Baghdad. Caliph al mamun he created a think tank, big building where manuscripts collected from all over the world were kept, studied, translated. Because Caliph Mamun said that knowledge has to be acquired from everywhere in the world. As, as the Prophet said, for knowledge, you have to go as far as China. So they had 
there is no barrier to knowledge. And how do you get knowledge? Unless you travel there, you at least get some manuscript. So they insisted that if a trader came to Baghdad, he has to, he better brought, bring a manuscript as a port of entry. You know? So manuscripts are brought and they were translated. And this is an image. You can see all the manuscripts, rolls of manuscripts are kept there. And they are studying them. They are also, they have developed um, 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 the um, instrument stops out the sky. So the Arab science had a huge appraisals in this period because House of Wisdom was truly a house where wisdom was stored. And that, again, it is not just um, and the science and technology, but many old texts found in Greek have, was translated. And so we are grateful to the House of Wisdom because this is Aristotle in Arabic. And this is the only translation that exists. So Greek, original Greek doesn't exist. So it has been reconstituted. Mm. People have translated it back in Greek to say this is what Aristotle said. But Aristotle's original is lost. Mm. So the Arabic translation done in the House of Wisdom mm. has helped the world to understand what Aristotle must say. Another empire builder was Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan created the world's largest land empire, which stretched from East China Sea to Black Sea. And so this huge land empire, what did it do? One of the things it did is to connect China to the to Europe. The Silk Road, which is called road, but actually the tracks, mule tracks that goes across the Central Asian desert. And, and those tracks were very risky to travel because of bandits. So when the Mongols took over, they patrolled. There was no bandit. Silk Road was very safe to travel. And he also developed postal system. The world's first postal system was developed by Genghis Khan. There was post, you deposit your letter, it will be carried by a horseman to a next post, it will be relayed until it reached destination. So the original idea of a post office, postal system was developed by the moment. And here it is an empire. But empire helped creating, benefiting trade, connecting the communities. And one of the things I cannot resist telling is that Mongols, they rode horses, as you know. And the Mongolian horses, because of the cold climate, their tail hair is very strong. Mm -hmm. So they made um, the bow to play the violin with the horse hair. And that was the first time that bow was made to play the violin. Until then, all the instruments were strings. You had strings, you just ting, 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 that's it. But playing it with a bow, gives you a very different sound. And so I'd say there would be no Vivaldi without Genghis Khan. <laughs> Genghis Khan brought the bow with which Vivaldi could play his four syllables. So now let's go back to the second part of my, so what is, this is how globalization, global connections came about. But what is the connection between pand pandemic that we see and globalization? And these are the main points they say 
that ultimately connections as the cities grew, more people close together, as agriculture developed, earlier there was a hunter and gatherer, they are going around killing animals, eating them, moving on. But once you have a sedentary agriculture where you are planting rice, wheat, whatever crop, and then staying there to crop, to harvest it, and then you develop animal husbandry and connections with animals is the beginning of trouble there. Travel for trade, travel of exploration and warfare, all this means humans coming in contact with each other. And with the disease, if it is infectious, that's how you transform. So this was this is a Greek, sorry, Egyptian painting. You can see that uh, animals became part of your daily life. And so you are raising goat and, and sheep and pork and pigs. And this is useful for your protein, but these animals, especially pigs, have a great capacity to absorb virus and make it in their own. The virus can stay in the pig's stomach, prosper without infecting the pig itself. So pig has no disease, but its stomach is a, becomes a factory of creating and, and, and uh, increasing the number of um, virus. So, this is, and so you are, for trading purposes, if you are infected with the infectious disease, you are passing it on to the, your trading partners. If you are a soldier, you are passing it on to the other soldiers or to the prisoners of war. And so the war and trade led to spread of infectious disease that didn't exist before. As long as humans were living in small groups, hunting, gathering, there was no infectious disease. It came only when sedentary agriculture developed and trading and then of course warfare. Don't need to be 
stop in this container. And uh, up to the then global population of 230 people, the Roman Empire is our other identity. Centuries probably is, I would say, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. In 541, we get the first known pandemic of bubonic plague, linked to a bacteria infecting small mammals, mainly rats and their fleas. In some cases, the rat fleas bite humans and transfer to bacteria to them. One infection reaches the thumbs, it becomes high contagious between humans. According to recent studies, the plague of Justinian started in Central Asia and spread by a land and sea trade routes to the Byzantine Empire. The capital of Constantinople is badly affected. As it dies on a commercial crossroad, the disease spreads throughout the Mediterranean basin. Byzantine military troops engaged in the West are contaminated, which forms the expansion of the empire. In Rome, Pope Pelagius II succumbs to the disease. In Mesopotamia, the Byzantine and Sicilian empires were very severely affected by the pandemic through steep war. This benefited the Arabs, who starved their Muslim conquests. The Sicilian Empire collapses, while the Byzantine Empire is greatly reduced. The plague of Justinian claims between 30 and 100 million victims over two centuries. So, the um, just the shots will tell you about how the, the first reported case of pandemic was Athenian plague in 430 BC. And that was when Athens was in a mortal combat with Sparta, the so-called Peloponnesian War of going. And this disease basically ended the war in fear of Sparta because Athenians killed by thousands, including the great leader of Athens. Uh, he himself uh, succumbed to the disease. And so, uh, this is, I'm just pausing for a minute to tell you the difference, I'm sure you know that bacteria, we are all calling them germ generally, but bacteria is a free living cell. It can live inside your body or outside your body. But virus is like a little fragment hanging in the air. It needs to find a host, some living cell. So if you are taking it through your nose, and it sticks onto the cell of the nose and gets sustenance from there, and then it starts replicating. So virus needs a host to replicate. Whereas, whereas uh, bacteria, is cholera is a bacteria. You just drink polluted water, bacteria is, is there, it goes to your stomach and it causes havoc. But in case of virus, it has to simply find a host which will accept it. And most of the time, body, the immune system rejects them. They said, no, we don't want you, we won't feed you. And so the virus dies, doesn't, doesn't develop. But the viruses have also evolved. They developed a way of actually sticking onto the human cells and replicating. And um, so these are viruses. These ones are which the kind of connector, which connect to your body cell to get the sustenance it needs. So the first recorded plague was 413 BC. And one doesn't know actually what was the disease. Most probably because there is no uh, physical remain 
So which case that can be analyzed, DNA analyzed now to find what disease they had, but most probably it was some kind of typhoid that, yeah. And then, There was the, the plague, sorry, and then there was the bubonic plague that I earlier clip showed, Justinian plague, Just, Emperor Justinius, um, his name is used to describe this plague. It is actually carried by fleas living on a rat. And the fleas um, come onto human body and the and the bacteria enters that way. Okay, let's just quickly move on to. So when this, um, this is again, the Mongol Silk Road was great. I mentioned it was ensured travel safely, but it also ensured travel by this. Central Asia was had a huge pool of rats which would jump into the wagon traveling and they would travel miles eating whatever they get on the wagon. And those rats were carrying the bacteria for the um, for so-called um, plague, the black, black death. And these then eventually arrived in the ports in the hull of the boat, and they will jump up the ship to the port. So the rats are very smart. They would jump on the wagon, then jump off the ship, and it caused absolute disaster to Europe. Almost 50 million people got killed. 50 million, that was just imagined uh, in those days. And so the one way of fight, fighting that was developed by Um, let's just move on. We can have more time. So Venice imposed quarantine. The word quarantine didn't exist in the dictionary until then. And quarantine is the word consisting of quarantine. So 40 days, you are kept out, not allowed to come to the port. And after, if that you survive, then you are allowed to come to the port. So 40 days, quarantine. So now we use quarantine, but actually it started as a 40 days separation from the port. Okay. So the other thing that happened was that, this is a Charles Kinney's comment, which is very apt, that the great days of discovery also truly worldwide pandemic, because one of the major discovery was Americans, North America. And North America was separated from the rest of the world by the rising water after the end of Ice Age. Because you know that This is Siberia, and this is Alaska. And you can see the water rose and eliminated the land bridge. So the land bridge that existed allowed ancestors to travel and go to South America. That disappeared, now it, there's water. And as a result, animals, everything grew independently in the two hemispheres until Christopher Columbus arrived and met these naked Native Americans, saying, these are people I have never seen, this kind of thing. And so this is the kind of reconnection of two groups of humans. They developed independently in the two hemisphere. This is Christopher Columbus and the Native Americans. 
and their union was not happy because the Europeans brought with them smallpox, flu, that they were completely exposed and immune because they had lived with this for centuries. But these American natives, they were completely exposed to this virus. And the result was So eight out of 10 natives were killed. So this reunification of the humanity was a very expensive affair. And then of course the Europeans figured out that this disease is a great weapon for us. So they actually deliberately used infected clothes and etc. to kill off the Native Americans. So it was, a, it was the first, you can say biological warfare knowing that this disease doesn't affect us, we are immune to flu, but this people get killed. These are the smallpox. Okay. And so I just wanted to show this, sorry. This is the Great London Plague of 1665. This plague, of course, killed 100,000 people. But this plague also is remembered for something it produced, which was nobody understood, expected, that a man called Isaac Newton, a student, who was forced to leave the campus, Cambridge campus, and stay home during this period of um, plague. Sorry. And so he, from his room, he could see across the old garden there the apple tree. And he used to see the apple drop. And you know the story that Isaac Newton's inquiry as to why did the apple always drop on the ground? And so the theory of gravity was invented during this great play of London. Okay. So I think, and the other great plague that affected humanity is this, is the Spanish flu of 1918. Fifteen to 100 million people all over the world. And this was much bigger than anything else because transportation was now very fast. There was steamships, railway train, people are traveling long distances and fast. And that means they carried the infection first. And so the first world war had just ended. Soldiers were returning home in thousands and they're bringing their disease in. So that was a absolute disaster. Yeah. At that time, World War Pain was neutral. So Spanish newspapers were not under any censors. So they could report the such change of these people were flying like flying. So it was called Spanish flu because they thought it was only Spain, but it yeah. happened all over Europe. But, but it was the name Spanish flu because Spanish newspapers reported. So this was more recent times. This civet cat is a delicacy Chinese like, and civet cat carried the virus of SARS. And somebody, the doctor who treated the patients in Guangzhou came to Hong Kong. He lived in this hotel, and he infected that floor. And people who touched the doorknob or lift uh, button, they went to France. Canada, US, they carried SARS with them. But one difference is that this is the first time 
that quarantine was used on a global scale because WHO exists. WHO said, stop travels and quarantine everybody. And the result was that this disease killed only 800 people. This would have been much more disastrous. Like you see that in Spanish flu, 50 million people killed, although the morbidity rate, meaning the percentage of people dying from infection was only 2.5%. Whereas in SARS, just 12%. But because well, quarantine was imposed, travel was stopped, and as a result, the disease could not be <coughs> spread. Professor Mayer. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. Yes. Yes. So COVID started in Wuhan, and Chinese government, because of censorship, didn't allow the news to be published, did not tell the WHO. And in this time delayed, it the COVID traveled from China to the rest of the world. So first case was in December. WHO was informed January 13 and March 11 it was declared pandemic. So you can see the time gap between this discovery and actual announcement, and that was a critical uh, mis mistake. Okay, I think I'll stop here and. We will take any question you might have. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maya Chanda. I think he's already explaining uh, the globalizations and pandemic from the perspective of deep history, you know, deep history, also deep cases of the uh, pandemic. And I think. Uh, we still have time for about, uh, I think, maximum 20 minutes. So if there is you know, some some question, so I think Professor uh, Nayan could uh, give some response. Uh, any questions first? Okay. Please uh, say your name, where you come from, and which party as well. So Professor Nanda will, will, uh, Nayan will know where to come from. Uh, please uh, sign. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to see you here in Brooklyn and thank you very much for the topic for being really interesting and really advanced. So, well, I have, okay, my name is Saima and I'm from Nepal. Your neighbor. <laughs> okay, so I have two questions. My first question is how much do you believe the reaction against globalization is happening now? And can uh, the history of globalization be used? to draw any comparison. And my second question is, um, what or who caused the most notable change in your thinking over time? Uh, and how has your understanding of the world altered over time? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, you know, the anti-globalization uh, is problematic because the word globalization didn't exist till 61. But the phenomenon of interconnectedness of different culture, economies, countries has existed for the last 10,000 years. And that existence has caused problems always. People like when um, the um, Spanish explorer arrived in the Philippines, uh, he said we should all follow Christ. And he was killed on the spot. He said, we don't want Christ. He killed him. So that was, you can call it anti-globalization because he was trying to preach the faith that he believed in. And the Spaniards and the Filipinos said no. So anti-globalization in that sense had always existed, although we did not, cannot call it anti-globalization. Opposition to connections, consequences of these connections. And right now, um, people who are, say they're anti-globalization, but they are still using the computer, mobile phone, because these are the absolute symbols of globalization. This phone has parts made in 40 different countries. 
and without those parts, one part missing, this phone won't work. So, so, but I can be still criticizing globalization. Sure, I can, but I cannot do without the products of globalization uh, in our daily life, you know. And that is the sort of irony. As to thinking, you know, this, what I said today, this is the idea I have developed over the years, studying, thinking. But I must tell you one story that I was then the editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review in 1999. We are planning to publish a special edition of the magazine on the first issue of 2000. So what could we, could we say all the publications will have a special issue of the 21st century, first issue of 2000. So I said, let's find out what happened in the previous century, how much the world has changed. And so what, for instance, when the sun rose on the January 1st, 19, 1900, what would be the man-made monument that would ray, get the first ray of the sun. And the answer was Borobudur. Borobudur shrine was the tallest man-made shrine in the world today at that time that would have got the first ray of the sun. So that made me question, how come Borobudur was built to the glory of the Buddha? came from your country. And so Buddha, how did Buddha's, Buddha's image reach 6,000 miles away in Indonesia? Who brought it? Why? And that's the kind of question led me to understand who are the factors, who are the actors who brought globalization. You know, so it was a question of studying and thinking. Any other question? Yeah, and the question is, yeah, please. Hello, hello, Professor uh, Dr. Mohan. Uh, thank you for presentation. It's a good, I mean, uh, we can see the impact of, uh, of, first of all, my name is Suryana. I'm a fellow of, um, uh, Faculty of Social Sciences, University of International Islam, Indonesia. Uh, you talk about, I'm not anti of globalization, but you talk about the impact of globalization. Uh, it should be negative and positive. And you, during your talking, uh, most of it is like positive. You can see uh, how. Um, modernization, how we, in your uh, explanation, we connect as uh, human uh, communities. Uh, maybe if this is related to the last slide you mentioned that uh, one of the impact of globalization uh, may produce uh, pandemics. Right? From the past, now we have uh, COVID-19. Uh, and in my experience, the vulnerable people, I mean, the, the poor people, poor country, that's the most uh, devastating uh, occurs in, in, in that place. Like I can mention in, in Indonesia as well. In, and uh, we have very, uh, very big problem. Um, my like brothers, neighbors died because of this this pandemic. So I mean, in your opinion, uh, what should we do? I mean, as a country or as uh, as, uh, as uh, analysts, as your your expert, uh, beside uh, quarantine, you mentioned quarantine hygiene. Uh, how healthy health, health lifestyle. Uh, what should we do as uh, maybe as a country? Should we have like uh, we, we can close our country, right? But how 
how how open how open we are. Uh, you mentioned about SARS in two thousand and three. Uh, I have like uh, paper about that. Uh, one say that Indonesia will have the I mean the problem of 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 this SARS, but it's not happening. That's why in the first uh, years of pandemic 2019, uh, some experts say Indonesia will not have the will would not would not get COVID because we have we strong, but in the end we are very vulnerable. That's that's my question. Okay, yeah, thank I think you, I think you can take one more. So yeah, maybe we sure. can wrap up the, the answer. Anyone more push any question? Yes, okay, sir. so we can. Okay, yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Hello, thank you very much for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. My name is Mr. Gopal Singh. I'm from Pakistan. And the student of PhD in particular your social science and that is a beautiful life. So my uh, it is a very general question actually. Uh, you uh, said there is a uh, during the ice age, the life was not possible with the passage of time. Uh, the life came into existence, and then you uh, uh, brief us about the history of pandemics. So, uh, due to global warming, uh, we are facing uh, uh, floods, we are facing pandemics, <coughs> and uh, earthquakes. <coughs> My question is that, do you think these uh, pandemics, these uh, earthquakes or uh, some uh, other, other, other catastrophic, you can say, situations are due to our uh, nature to balance the, to balance the world? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, probably we have five minutes for you okay. to respond. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, um, so, um, your question was about uh, anti-globalization. Um, uh, anti-globalization, is it, what was the actual question? Uh, I mean, we have pandemics, how to, how to, how to count? Uh, yes, how to, how to protect yourself, yeah. Um, I think uh, it is, clear that science, you have to rely on science, absolutely. And the hygiene at an individual level, at a community level, is a must. Hygiene is the first line of defense. And then, of course, um, spending resources to develop um, vaccines, Vaccines, there is a lot of people suspicious of vaccines. They don't want vaccines. And so they are paying with their lives. A lot of people who didn't take vaccines, they are they're dead. So you have to believe in science and, and spend enough resources. The problem is that most countries do not have resources. And the rich countries have resources and they are using the resources to develop uh, medic medicine for rich people's disease, you know, a heart disease, uh, um, um, uh, diabetes, uh, cancer. These are the, because medicine, um, those people who, those who need those are mostly from rich countries. And, so they can afford to pay a large amount of money for the medicine. So medical companies and government has to get involved in funding research and producing medicines that for common people, not just for the rich people. Uh, as to your point about um, this natural disasters that is that are happening, they definitely have connections with our lifestyle. Now the scientists are calling our age Anthropocene. Anthropocene is the age of humans. Humans, although constitute a small part of the entire planet, we have done enormous damage to the environment 
causing what we have seen today. The world climate, time, and climate change is a fact. Pakistan has seen this in this massive flood. Every day there's something happening, like in, in, uh, in uh, I think in Sudan, uh, there have not been rain for months. So this uh, climate change is definitely caused by humans. And climate change is having also impact on disease. This is something that not many people care to know is that increasing warm weather, permafrost in Siberia, the thick layer of ice that has existed for thousands of years are melting. And when they're melting underneath, there is two things that are coming. One is the methane gas, which has been accumulating under, which is a rotting from the vegetation that was under the ice. Those rotting vegetation is producing methane gas, which is being released in the air. And methane gas is the worst kind of uh, warming gas. Secondly, viruses, old viruses are being released in the air. They are coming to life in the warm climate. So scientists are very worried that they are going to be finding virus they have no idea about. They have already found a couple of them. These viruses are going to come out of nowhere and will be victim. So this is the indirect consequences of global warming. So uh, what I'm saying is pretty frightening, but I am sure I, I think that is whatever we can do collectively, we have to do to delay the global warming. That's a very, very dangerous development. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mayan Chanda. Uh, he already gave us a very substantive lecture on globalization and pandemics. And he also, uh, well, dig up very deeply on the background of globalizations and even start from the human number one, you know, where the migration start from Africa and then where the different code finally we have from maybe M1, M21, you know, into a different kind of coding that finally basically human migrated from that part of uh, the continent. And <clears throat> of course, uh, well, there are different uh, actors and globalizations that he already mentions, uh, which is actually the four actors, the traders, the preachers, the adventurers, and also the warrior. And I think uh, that four categorizations, I think is also subject to discuss, is also uh, important when we would like to discuss on how to combat uh, pandemics. Because pandemic also need traders, you know, those who are trading medicine, you know, uh, they also need preachers, someone who make assuring other people that we should follow the good life, good guideline, a guide, a good, a good life, and also uh, adventures. Scientists might be part of this adventures, you know, they do research, they deep research from their subject, so finally they are able to uh, invent or to find uh, the drugs or, or the medicine or the virus and the warrior, you know, of course, this is a uh, very important part for us. But the point is that <clears throat> today we have been learning a lot of uh, stuff from his expertise and uh, when his book on uh, the globalizations that relate to the, the traders, the preachers, and also the adventures, the warrior will be very important uh, book for us also to read, you know. And we have been passing long journey of history, uh, our regions, our area, uh, from we are living here before the European come to came to this area. Professor Chanda also mentioning about the Borobudur, you know. We have uh, our strong uh, regional development or national or people developed here uh, during the era before the European hegemony, you know, but I think we need also to explore deeper on the future uh, developments of our knowledge and also human interactions 
in order uh, to address the issues of pandemic in our future. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nayan Chanda. Uh, it has been great to have you here and we look forward to see you again. Thank you very much for everyone who okay. Okay, so I think we can take photo together. So for the memory of this small part of globalization, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Yeah. Okay, so uh thank you. I come from Robotu. So